Hi, I'm Jonathan Weiner, and welcome to season six of Are You Listening? For this episode, I'm going to talk about how to tell when your mix is ready for mastering. And this could apply to scenarios where you're actually going to finish a mix, then master it yourself, send it off to someone else, or even assessing the mix that you're working on if you're mixing through a mastering chain. In order to really understand this, you probably want to turn off that mastering chain for a moment and listen to your mix and uh, evaluate it through the lenses that I'm going to be uh, describing. The first thing to say, once again, is to come back to the notion of references. If you want to evaluate mix balance, you're thinking about genre and the sort of overall setting of your mix, certainly comparing your mix to references makes sense. However, remember, if you're listening to references that are mastered, they're going to be pretty hot. And I highly recommend that you don't try to achieve the same level that you'll find in a master in your mix session. So be prepared to turn down your references however much it takes so that maybe the vocal is sitting at about the same place when you're comparing your mix to the mastered reference and then observe what the relative balances are within the um, mix session. One thing to look for in a mix to be sure that it's going to be workable when the time comes to master is observe the level of the lead instrument. If you do what's called a needle drop, and this goes back to the idea of a record player where you could take the, the stylus and place it in different parts along the groove of the surface of an LP, you drop the, the playback head in your DAW in the intro and the first verse and the second verse and the second chorus and the outro, if you observe huge differences in level in your lead instrument, where the vocal, even if the vocal is audible at the beginning, if the level of the vocal, the lead vocal is changed by six, eight, 10 dB, going from beginning to the end, you're probably setting yourself up for a challenging mastering session. Because anything you do, especially in the arena of dynamic range compression, when the vocal is very quiet, probably won't work for the very end of the mix. And during mastering, you'll have to reimagine the gain staging of the mix from the beginning of, to the end to make it a good listening experience for your audience. So that's one thing to think about when you're listening to the mix before you say, okay, let's go on to the next step. One of the most common things that we do in mastering is reconcile the difference between foreground and background or the loudest instruments and the quietest instruments when needed by applying a little bit of dynamic range compression. But there's only so much of that that we can do. It's important in your mix to make sure that the balance between the lead, and I'm using a vocal as the proxy for this, but if you're working on instrumental music where it's a lead guitar or a horn or something like this, this could apply equally well. Make sure that the balance between that lead voice and the supporting cast is in a pretty good place. One way to be sure of that is to listen to your mixes on a band-limited speaker that just plays the mid-range, doesn't have any low-end or any high-end like the old Oratone mix cubes or you know wire into some boombox or something like that. The other way to tell is just listen very quietly. If you turn down the playback of your mix so that the, the level of the voice is relatively low in your environment, can you still hear enough of the support of the harmonized instruments, the instruments that, that sketch out the chords and the harmonic motion in a piece? That's another way to tell whether the balance is good enough so that you're ready to move on to mastering. While we can adjust tonal balance in mastering, it's also important to get the tonal balance at least in the ballpark in mixing. If things are too skewed, it may be challenging to make a record sound good enough that you your audience will want to lean in. In fact, sometimes when I think about loudness and whether a record sounds loud or not, one of the things I'm thinking about is, would the audience want to listen to it loudly? Not whether it's high on a meter, but would it sound good if it's turned up in an environment? So turn it up in your environment. When you turn up your mix, 
Does the upper mid-range bark at you? Is the upper mid-range supported by the bass, by the low mid-range? Does it have kind of a warmth and an invitation to turn it up and still hold together and sound pleasant, or does it make you want to run away from your speakers? Now, of course, that's all within reason. You don't want to turn it up so loud that you're going to hurt yourself or blow up your speakers, but give it a 5, 6, 8 dB boost and see if the mix still holds together when you turn it up. This next tip involves the relationship between the level of mixes to the level of masters and how that translates to comparative loudness when a track gets out into the world. It's a given that most of the time, I would say 99% of the time, that the level of a master track will be at least a little bit hotter than the mix would be. The implication to that is you need to leave a little bit of headroom. If you notice when you're setting up your mix that your peak level is hitting minus three, minus two, or even zero dBFS, in other words, it's very, very close to the top of the scale, and at the same time that your average level is quite low, let's say the RMS level is sitting at minus 16 or 18 or minus 20, that may set up a scenario where you're going to have trouble getting the mastered level up high enough without completely destroying the sense of rhythm and transience and dynamics. And it's probably a sign you need to go back and reassess what's going on with the drum bus, uh, what's going on with the transients. It might be a tonal balance issue. But the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, is if you're peaking at zero and your average level is very low, that's probably going to represent some problems for you when the time comes to master. A scenario that can present significant challenges in mastering, in fact, I think this is one of the toughest challenges in mastering, is when you have two elements in a mix that live more or less in the same part of the spectrum that are very divergent in terms of the timbre. What I mean by that is, let's say you have a mix and your snare drum is dull and your vocal is bright. When you're mastering, in order to get the master to translate and sound good, you might want to smooth out the vocal, but it further smooths out the snare drum. You can see where that's potentially a problem or an issue. We do have technology that we can use to try to reconcile these differences, like dynamic equalizers or frequency-specific compressors to try to reduce the dynamic range in just part of the overall timbre in a track. But ultimately, this is something that's much better addressed in a mix session. So the way you can tell if this is a problem is sit back and listen to your mix and listen for the nasal or the edgy region, for instance, in a mix. And if you listen across all of the individual elements in a mix, let's say we're listening for the tonal quality around 2.5 or 3K or 4K, are all of the elements that show up in that range and speak in that range more or less in the same place? You know, is the top of the vocal, the pointiness in a kick drum, the sharpness of a snare drum, the edginess in a distorted guitar, are they all pretty well balanced and pretty well blended? If they are, even if the whole mix is a little bit dull or bright, we can adjust that in mastering relatively easily. You take out a little bit of upper mid-range and smooth out all of the elements in a mix together. But if you're noticing very, very divergent characteristics in specific parts of the spectrum, that's probably a sign you need to go back and make some adjustments to the mix in order to get a good master. Usually when you compare the difference between a mix and a master, the master is usually a little bit brighter. That's either because we add a little top end sometimes in mastering or just by dint of the fact that we are doing some signal processing. Anytime you apply a limiter or compressors with fast releases or certainly using exciters, etc., we'll get more high end. Because of that, it's important to listen for sibilant energy in your mix. The sibilants are the S's and the fricatives the t and the, the high frequency transient sounds mostly associated with vocals, but even hi-hats, tambourines, any transient high frequency information. If you already have a mix that's pretty bright, then in the mastering stage, if the overall track gets brighter, you may find yourself needing to work harder to try to keep that high frequency energy in check because there will just be too much of it. You don't want to dumb down your mix to anticipate what's going to happen in mastering. You want your mix to be as good as possible. But uh, one thing that you could do is make sure that you don't have too much top end in your mix already 
to prevent that problem from happening downstream. Now, the next one is not necessarily a sign that you've got a problem, but it's a sign that you might want to take a look. When we're measuring the level of mixes, we can use a couple of different kinds of meters to measure the level. We can either look at a standard loudness meter, which typically uses RMS to measure level, or we can look at an, a LUFS meter or an LUFS meter, which looks at average level, but it's weighted according to frequency. What does that mean? Well, if you have a one kilohertz tone playing back at a certain level and a 40 hertz tone playing back at exactly that same level on an RMS meter, it will register the same. But when you listen to it coming out of your speakers, even if they're full range speakers, the 40 hertz tone will be much quieter. So LUFS metering is weighted in order to reflect our perception. It's not just a measure of level in the box. If you have a mix that's extremely bass heavy, it may register very, very differently on an LUFS meter compared to an RMS meter. When you're measuring your mix and looking at metering, for instance, if you look at Insight, you can see an RMS measurement, and you can also see a momentary LUFS measurement. If they are the same to within a dB or two, then you probably have pretty good tonal balance in your mix. But if you're seeing an LUFS measurement, that is much, much lower than the RMS measurement, that means you've got a lot of extra bass in your mix. And so the perceptual loudness of the mix will not be as hot as something else that has an integrated LUFS that's closer to the RMS level. So there's an invitation there to take a look again at what's going on in the low end of your mix. Do you have a lot of subsonic information that you could take out without damaging the mix? and get something that sounds clearer and louder and, frankly, better. Most people would agree that the hardest part of a mix and the hardest part of the spectrum to get right is in the low end. If you get the relationship between all of the instruments that occupy energy in the, the bass region in good proportion, it's possible in mastering to go ahead and adjust things so that the bass stands in good proportion to the mid-range and to the high end. However, if you don't manage the relationship between low-frequency transient instruments and low-frequency tonal instruments, that can create challenges, like real challenges, in mastering. It's also, because it's hardest to hear, we have some tools available to us to help us understand low end. Certainly, you know, your headphones are going to help you understand the bottom octave or two in the spectrum compared to your speakers. A metering that shows you spectrum will help you understand the proportion of low end to the rest of the spectrum. A tool that you'll find in the tonal balance control meter, it's in the upper left-hand corner, it shows the crest factor, or the relationship between the transient, the peak, if you will, in the low end, and the sustain in the low end. There's a lot of latitude in terms of, there, there's no single right answer, but if you see that meter wandering in such a way that the crest factor is very high. That means that the relationship between the low frequency transient, the low frequency energy that comes along with a kick drum, for instance, compared to the tone of the bass that follows it is a little bit out of whack. That's something to look at. This is one of the biggest enemies of clarity and loudness and can create problems for you in mastering. A good practice before you sign off on a mix is to dedicate one good solid listen to make sure that there are no distracting noises that are embedded in your mix. While it's possible to pull out clicks and pops and tiny little ticks or anything that might be a distraction in the mastering phase, if you're dealing with something like maybe even a vocal breath, but certainly a mouth click or pickup noise or something like that that's a problem in the mix, it's much better to deal with that in the mixing phase. So before you sign off, just make it part of your discipline to give it that one listening pass to make sure there are no unwanted noises that you can deal with pretty easily in the mix session. So there are some ideas about things to listen for, things to look at in metering to help you make sure that you're setting yourself up for success in mastering, and I hope that they're helpful to you. As always, check the show notes below for links to other learning assets, learning opportunities, and resources, and enjoy your work. Thanks for watching. Thank you.